All right. Um, a couple of heads up. Let me give you a heads up on the next two assignments. Okay. Um, over next week, we only have one class. You know, a week from today is Thanksgiving, so we don't meet uh, a week from today. Uh, but uh, over the Thanksgiving, from Tuesday to the following Tuesday, your assignment is to spend some time over Thanksgiving, 20 minutes talking with an entrepreneur from your home ward or stake. And I'll give you a list of questions to ask them. Okay, right. No fair talking to your dad. I was like, what if we do that every day? Then, then you can already do it tonight and have it be done so you can then spend a leisurely turkey weekend. Okay? So the idea is to find somebody that is an entrepreneur in your past and you just didn't know about it and you never took the time to talk to them previously. So now your assignment is to spend some time over Thanksgiving weekend to track them down and say, I wish I had spent more time with you when I was a teenager. Tell me more about what you've done with your life and how you became a successful entrepreneur. Okay. So that's a heads up on that. Uh, and, you know, if you already have someone like that that you've talked to, find somebody new. You know, I mean, I won't know, but you'll know. You know, if you already know all about somebody, why interview them for a, you know, a quick assignment for the class? Interview somebody new and learn something new, okay? Uh, and then for Tuesday, uh, I need to check one thing with the library to see if, if we're 100% okay with uh, copyright laws. But uh, there's a, a journal on the internet called Innovations, uh, published by MIT. And one of their issues was free. So you, any, you, you could look at the issue for free on the internet and all the different articles. Most of their issues were subscription. So I'm going to check to make sure that one is still available. And then I will split you up to have you pick one of the articles uh, to read over the weekend and be prepared to uh, discuss next Tuesday. So look for that on your email. Anyone that's not getting the email assignments or seeing them on Blackboard. Okay. And here is a good time. If you don't already have a contact in the class, this is a time to make sure you have someone else you can contact with. Because if you get stuck Saturday or Sunday and say, oh, I can't, I, I can't find the assignment, I can't find where this is on the internet, I want you to go first to one of your classmates to have them show you where it is and how to get into it and not be calling me. You know? So have a, have a comrade in the class that can help you make sure you find where it is on the internet. Okay. Any, any questions about what that will be like? So there's like 12, 14 different articles, and I don't want everyone reading the same article. I want, you know, eight of you reading, you know, the first section, you know, choosing between one and two of those, some more of you choosing that. So I will assign you, I'll say like, all right, if your last name is A to F, pick one of these three articles, you know, et cetera. Any, any questions? All right. Look for that uh, later today or tomorrow in your email or on Blackboard to get the specific site. But uh, innovations, you can probably, you've already Googled it, Anthony? Not yet. Okay. Would, would, would you do that and to see if you can see that one online? It was an interesting issue. It was about social entrepreneurism and mobile technology. So how cell phones and mobile access is changing people's lives around the world. MIT Press, I think it was, but Google Social Entrepreneurship Innovations. Uh, do you already have it? Do you know how long ago it was? I got it right here. It was like three years ago, I think. It could be in the, um, the JSTOR, you know, when you through the academic yeah. library. And if okay. it's there, then anybody can access it. Okay. All right. Well, they, they scared us pretty good when we, on the first signing up about, you know, not breaking copyrights and, you know, what you can send. 2008, all of them are free. All of them are free? Yeah, some are 
Do, do you see the, the one issue I'm talking about? Uh, well, is it about uh, social and potential entrepreneurship at the macro level? No. Well. Three lessons for success. Right here. This one. This is the website. Yeah, I know. It's another issue, I think. Yeah, well, issue three. go down, go down, go down to the very end. Entrepreneurship development. Right. I'll have to look at a little more. Okay. Less so, so it looks like we have. Less looks like. Mm, that wasn't the one I was looking at. All right. Anything that you have found on uh, searching about social entrepreneurship? The, this was an excellent journalist. Had some really great articles, so uh, that's one to keep in mind for the future use. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is if you were to take this course at, uh, there, there's a, a university outside of Washington, D.C. There's one of the leading universities in social entrepreneurship called George Mason University. Uh, and, you know, Harvard has some social uh, enterprise issues. Uh, NCAD in Paris has some, you know, most universities are starting to develop a social entrepreneurship program. If you go to most of those universities, um, you will see the, uh, sustainability as a big issue. And one thing that they cover more than what I have wanted to cover in this course is what I would refer to as public policy. You know, I've tried to stay social entrepreneurship in the trenches here, how you're going to go out and make a difference at the micro level. And a lot of the social entrepreneurship courses deal a lot with the macro level. You know, how are you going to influence the Congress and government entities at that higher level to make a difference in policy to help control the world's social issues? Okay, so do you, do you see the difference? Uh, uh, a really high level versus uh, a micro level, a macro versus micro compared to economics. So if, if that interests you, uh, you're going to have to do that on your own because we're going to spend very little time between now and then, you know, deciding whether Chevron should, you know, do something different when they're hunting for oil in Indonesia. Well. Uh, I don't think many of you are going to be working as officers of Chevron very soon. Hopefully, you know, 30 years from now you will be. But, you know, for your practical implementation of social entrepreneurship principles, I'm, I'm skipping a lot of that. Okay. Anyone have any, any comments or feel for that? You know, a lot, the, a lot of the courses around the country are preparing you to go into corporate America and help them shift their corporate policy to deal with social issues. That's something I've chosen not to do. But I think you could apply a lot of the principles we've been talking about at that level if you want to. But um, I didn't really want to get into the politics of you know, lobbying government officials to get more money you know, for your organization, for example. All right. Uh, here's a, here's a, I, I want to throw out a, a, a discussion topic. Um, I, most of you were very complimentary about the Great Ideas Conference or Exchange. Uh, you said, oh, good ideas, good ideas. Was that to stroke the professor and our department that was a sponsor of it, or did you really believe that? I, was I mean, bitter. what? I was bitter. <laughs> okay, uh, your personal uh, feelings aside, Anthony. Yeah, I, for the most part, yes, it was good. Idea. It was yeah. good. I, I frankly, you know, I, I was. I'm going to take the other side. I was a little disappointed. I thought a lot of people just threw up and, you know, literally threw up, vomited 
some ideas that they haven't even analyzed to see if it'll make much sense. You know, they just came up with a great idea. I mean, obviously we were trying for maximum participation, so we weren't going to turn anyone down, but I wish we had had more people think through it and, and get to that, and hopefully that's what's going to happen in January, February, and March as we approach. We have named the, the competition in March, and in fact, we actually have guidance from the higher authorities to avoid the word competition. Uh, they don't want to have competition be it, so uh, I think we're going to call it uh, uh, empowering great ideas or empowering something. Um, but that's where you'll really get down and really work hard to make it a solid plan and not just a flimsy idea. Uh, but it, here's the question I wanted you to discuss. R Ryan, did you have a hand up earlier? Yeah, I was just going to say that I was kind of disappointed because I, I liked the form. I thought the form was really good where everybody got together because um, last year it was a little bit less organized. Um, but as far as the great ideas, by the time I was there watching it, I just kept thinking these are the best ideas that we had. Because like, I heard some awesome ideas just like in the little groups. That, and so I don't know how they actually judged it this year. Huh. But I felt like the people we were sharing the ideas with didn't really know how to judge it. And so okay. we just kind of ended up with what they kind of remembered. But, you know, like, there were some super good okay. ideas. So you, you, you saw some good ideas. Okay. That's yeah. what I was bitter about. But they didn't get to the end. Okay. And so, I don't know. Okay. All right. Max? I, I think regardless of what happens next year, I mean, A, I, I kind of agree with them. I think a lot of ideas got overlooked. I think that too many of the people went for, oh, a business plan for, oh, you're going to start a restaurant? That's an excellent idea. We're going to discount these ideas because that's a business idea we can sink our teeth into. Rather than big ideas, it became a business idea competition. Okay. But the other thing was, I think next year they really need to train, train the judges for those forms more. Because in our group, for example, you're supposed to have two minutes each. And the first two people that went, they're like, well, we're a team, so we're going to team our time together. And then they went for like 15 minutes, and like the rest of us got like 30 seconds to present our stuff. Okay. And like the guy just sat there and was like, oh, I like this. Yeah, yeah. And we're like, and like they just kept talking and talking. And we're like, well, we, we, what, do I, I don't what, know. what were they talking about? What was the nutshell of their idea? They wanted to start a uh, health food store on BYU campus so they could eat there, basically. Okay. It was, it was mainly for their, for, that was the thing I commented, that right. it was mainly for their benefit, too. Right. If you have any other suggestions about how to make it better next year, again, email them to us. But here's the idea I want you to briefly discuss here. Does it do any good to let a student think he has a good idea when he really doesn't? You know, how do you, how do you balance that? You know, you, you want people to not be afraid to submit an idea or to participate, but how do you tactfully say to someone, that's crap? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's the problem, isn't it? Is uh, hopefully the person that presented it isn't thinking it's crap and they're just trying to bluff, right? Okay, hopefully well, they do well, think well, that way. You knew that the Monopoly story you shared the other day, everyone thought it was horrible, but you didn't have to blow it up. Monopoly nice. Good point. Good point. And, and I found out uh, the one about, uh, remember I said Dr. Seuss, right? I, I found the exact number. It said. <coughs> and find it again, or if I lost it one more time. The good and bad ideas all relative, though. Yeah. Dr. Seuss's first children's book was rejected by 23 publishers. The 24th publisher sold 6 million copies. Right. You can help critique them and find out if there's something that you feel as a professional and having been there before, hey, this is where you're probably missing a few things. Right? I mean, just to say, hey, your idea sucks. I think that's your target. Mm -hmm. Sharon? Uh, in our group years ago, she is, she's from Korea, and she came up on an idea about to make a, a rice cooker, um, mm -hmm. because she's, she felt uh, very irritating to always wash her rice. She um, thought about how to make a rice cooker, just like the washing machine. And <laughs> you put rice in it, and then you just push the button, and everything. Uh -huh. But uh, the judge, he wasn't really 
say anything about all of us about, wow, you, you wouldn't go on to wash your rice. Like it's kind of, that's, that's the idea. I don't know how to judge it. It's a good idea or bad idea. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, in general, you know, because you're gonna you're gonna see this all over in your your life to come. Is people will present ideas, and they won't know, you know, they're not gonna work. You know, they won't know they're even close to it. And and sometimes I've felt that way here on campus. Is we do we coddle the students a little too much, and you know, let them you know take little baby steps, and we really need to wake them up and say. No, come on, get with it. Hey, Michael. You know, I, I was thinking, like, whether or not you judge it's a bad idea, that's going to be your opinion either way. Um, uh, that's going to differ on people, and uh, you want to get as many people's honest opinions as possible, but that's kind of difficult for you. The one thing that I really liked about our group when we had the data of these exchange was they weren't interested at all in saying whether or not this is a good idea or this is a bad idea. Actually, I think all of the people in our group have really good ideas. But what the um, mediators were there for was to tell us, OK, so this is your idea. But um, you mentioned these points. However, think about these other points as well, like uh, what do you need to do in order to gain, uh, like, to gain market share? Who do you need to contact? What, what is going to be your source of the income? All the questions that you need to think through in order to make this thing possible. And then whether or not it actually happens to be a great idea later, um, then that's something that you can find out if you decide to implement it. Uh -huh. All right, well, I think we had one last hand and then let's move on. All right, well, two. We'll do two. I think it's also a, a point of whether you think it's a good idea. Because if somebody comes along and, you know, rains on your parade and you just fold, Obviously, you didn't think it was a great idea, but if you're if that fuels your fire, then it's like, excuse me, I'm gonna show you it's a good idea. In fact, that's most of my ideas. People, you know, poo poo my idea, and it's just like, you know what? I'm gonna rub your face in it. So, uh huh. I that that my ideas are great. All right. We keep keep that in mind, and then Ryan, and then we'll come back to this one. I was just going to say that the fun part of the exercise is being able to share your idea with other people and they kind of help you flesh it out. And so a lot of times, you know, like you're so focused on your idea that you buy into the fact that maybe it's better than it really is. And as you hear yourself share it with other people, you may even just come to the conclusion that, you know, maybe it's not a great idea. Like one of the guys next to me, it's a friend of mine, he was... You know, he wanted to do a different Pringles can. And as he's going through it, and as everyone's asking him questions, he finally realizes, he's like, oh yeah, that's not gonna work, because their can is iconic. And if I tweak it so that the chips come out differently, then the can will cost 50 cents more and people won't buy it. So, I mean, he kind of worked through it on his own, even though it was a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, think, I think more often than not, you'll realize that your idea is not that great once you get into it. Okay. Um, this idea of opposition is, uh, as we know from the scriptures, it's an important part of life. Uh, think of, of all the things that they're opposites in life. Uh, birth, death, build, destroy, up, down, love, hate, male, female, yin, yang, uh, laughter, tears, joy, sorrow, win, lose, strong, weak, light, dark, plus, minus. You know, big, big range of opposition in life. The creative process is often a dynamic oscillation between opposites. To understand the positives, we must know the negatives. When we know how the opposites interact with one another, we have the information we need to solve the problem. An understanding of opposition gave Einstein a great insight into the relationship between Newtonian physics and his own theory of relativity. Can a thing be in motion and at rest at the same time? The question seems foolish, yet contemplating the opposites at work in the universe gave Einstein this explanation. 
For an observer in free fall from the roof of a house, there exists during his fall no gravitational field in his immediate vicinity. If the observer releases any objects, they will remain relative to him in a state of rest. For a musician, the points of rest where there is no sound or music are an important part of the musical piece. Think about it. The rest in the music is important. For a writer, what you don't say is as, a, as, is as important as what you do say. For an artist, the negative shape is more important than the positive. Most people don't even see it, but if you get the negative shape right, the positive will almost always be right. So interesting ideas about opposition there. All right, uh, we need to form up in some, how many groups? Let's try to get groups of five. So uh, why don't you five there? How about, uh, let's see. Just, just do it. <laughs> yeah, self-create. Let, let's, 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 let's split up the Hanneman geniuses. Can one of you come over here a bit. Pull, pull a chair, maybe come over here. We need, we need some men over here. We don't want all the, the family, you know, creativity to stay in one pot. All right, Max, we'll put you back there with this group. Turn around there. You guys got to be able to talk to each other. So uh, maybe two of you come over, put your chairs this way, and be with these three here. We got that. All right, we need some diversity in this group, all, all the same geographic region. Oh, we got here. You got five there. Uh, Ammon, come down here and be with this group, please. No, no, no. Right, in fact, why don't you guys pull your chairs over here so you can get a little more distance. So, yeah. I You guys are already talking, you have no idea what you're supposed to be talking about, right? <laughs> Joni, are you going to participate? Oh, come, come over here. We need, they, have, they have enough over there. So April, go, go over there so you can be a little farther away from that group. All right. Okay, these five questions you're going to talk about in relation to this. Okay, you ready? Use a ball to develop a product idea. The ball can be big or small, hard or soft, colorful or plain, but there has to be a ball in a new product that you come up with. Okay? A ball. That, that this is a creative assignment for you to not be limited by anything I say. Okay? But you'll want to describe the product and how it will be used, describe who will purchase and use the product, and include that in number five. You know, how, how, how many people do you think might, appeal, that might this appeal to? Is it five or 500 million? Describe the uses, situations for the product, and what price will you charge for the product? Okay, you have 10 minutes. So there just has to be a ball. Just has to be a ball involved as a, and the ball has to be a fairly crucial part of it. You can't, you can't have it be a minor, minor, insignificant piece of it. The ball has to be pretty central to the product. Okay, not, not the only part of it, but pretty central. Ooh, now we've, now we've stopped the flow of conversation. Remember our brainstorming ideas? Just let it, let it flow, let it flow.
Right. Make someone be a scribe. Have assign somebody to be a scribe.
you better decide on a product soon because you got to have a few minutes for the answers. So make it, make a choice. Three minutes, three minutes.
All right, wrap it up. All right, go back to your seats, please. You're able to draw that on that? Huh? You have no idea what that is. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. All right. How many of you like that experience? Was that fun to discuss in a group something? Okay. All right. How many, of you, how many of you would say, oh, we should never do that again? Anyone? Okay, so a reasonable activity. Okay. Um, 
you know, part of having a class like this is we get to do and try some things. Just like an entrepreneur, we get to try some things. If they don't work out, let me know so we don't do them again, all right? While you're hearing some feedback from the other groups about their ball ideas, look at these 10 hurdles, or as uh, Von Eck called them, locks. L. And he said, these keep your creativity locked up. And you need to unlock these 10 barriers to keeping your creativity going. So think, did you hear any of these uh, during your small groups? And we'll, we'll flesh them out a little bit more in a second. All right, who wants to share some things you learned from your group? Both the learning process and actually what your ball product was. Right, who wants to start out? How about a visual aid here? We got a visual aid. Go. All right, Shem. Yeah, it comes up. Um, we had uh, okay, several ideas. Um, it was a good experience to talk about ideas. I mean, you think about the ball, it's kind of uh, a simple thing. And you know, first you start out with like playing ideas and then maybe practical ideas. Uh, we, went, we went through a few. One that we talked about. Um, was the, the water tricycle or the water chariot. Uh, they have something right now that's kind of, it's kind of similar to what you came up with, but it's like, it kind of looks like this, but it's all on skis and it's propelled by skis. But instead of it being skis, it would be a, it'd be more, it'd be a ball in front. And then you have uh, your handlebars right here. And this would be on a hinge. And then you have two floating skis in the back, um, and then basically that. And then so, basically the way it worked is you you pull it to propel yourself, and then the ball is what keeps you afloat. And the ball would probably look better than the ski because um, it wouldn't be as easy to tip, and it give you uh, a little more balance rather than having it. Uh, this is how the finished product looks, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, yeah. and any of these you want to talk about? You don't have to if you don't want to, but. Um, that's not what we use. Um, people that would purchase it is probably people in our, our age um, or younger. Um, it'd probably be a good, you know, uh, elderly, they, they like to do water exercises, um, so they could even use it. Um, How much are you guys gonna sell it for? Okay. All right, thank you. Yeah. Next. All right, Joy. Could you make that ball like the, the wheels on the ferry so it turns into another momentum, like put slats in it so it's pulling the water too? So it can right, run. yeah. That's something Anthony said was that there'd be like rivets or grooves in it so that um, it would catch, catch the water easily. Yeah. Thank you. Any other, any other things you want to talk about from your group? that came up? We're going to sell two billion of these. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And no one told them that's a bunch of crap, OK? <laughs> it, will, it will deplete all, all uh, traffic jams on islands. <laughs> all right. Who wants to go next? Now, now uh, think about that. You've, have you heard the idea that the butterfly moving its wings in China affects the weather in the United States? You heard that idea before. What if everyone got so much buffer and you know they ate more, and then we had a problem because we had to increase our supply of food because all these people were getting so so strong and burning more calories with this? <laughs> you know, I mean, the domino effect of you you flapping your wings and changing the world. All right, over here. How about the group at the back? Sure, we'll we can do it. Can we want to just tell you? We don't really have a picture. That's right. Just tell us. So uh, our product is to uh, work with FIFA and design a new World Cup ball for the 2014 games. Uh, there was a lot of 
controversy over the last <coughs> um, in the last uh, in this past World Cup. Um, primarily, it's made of eight pieces. Historically, a soccer ball is made of 32, and then they took it down to 16 for the World Cup in 2006. And then they thought they should take it down to eight with the idea that uh, it'd be easier for a goalkeeper to manage the ball and there's less grooves um, to catch air when you kick it and whatnot. Um, but it turned out to not be a very good um, idea. Well, not so much idea, but um, the actual product wasn't well received. And there's a lot of controversy behind it. So we would work with FIFA to develop an improved product for the next World Cup. And if they accepted our idea and we work together, then we could sell a lot. The last fall sold 13 million balls. And they sell at $135 a piece right now. So with inflation, the ball will probably sell for more like 150 in 2014. And um, if it's a good ball that people like, it'll probably sell more. Because the last ball was not well received. The prior ball sold a lot. Um, we don't know the target market size. We didn't have time to look at it, but it's okay. two billion. Yeah. All right. Any comments about the process? I can't imagine who came up with the idea to steer you to soccer, right? <laughs> 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 who would that have been in your group, huh? <laughs> All right. Next, how about this group? Where was it? Oh, you were there. All right. We're going to make a product that's uh, a binding, like a wacky uh, ball, a wacky ball, and we're going to make a binding on it. So it's a, how do you say? We're going to make it, we can switch the, we can move our legs. Because when we do a wacky ball, and uh, our leg is always like a stuck on there, we don't, we cannot move our legs. And we're going to make a ball inside the binding. So, when you stand on the wakeboard, and you can... W w wakeboard, right? Yeah. W wakeboard, so you're a wakeboard, you know, being pulled behind a ski boat, and your, your binding right now is fixed, so you're going to put a ball bearing in there to have some more mobility to let your binding move more like a surfboard, right, or, or otherwise? Okay, so, you're, so your foot is not locked there, okay. But you can choose to lock it if you like, because like, sometimes it, you cannot control yourself. Like the people, beginners, it's hard, kind of hard for them to start with force, like move forward binding. So you can either lock it or you can use the uh, lock it so you can move your legs and then uh, so you can do some jumping. Mm -hmm. And then it will be used for like for the snow or all kinds of mm -hmm. uh, What's your potential market size? <coughs> Okay. Because when I snowboard, I know that my legs hurt really bad, so it would be nice to sometimes be able to move up and not be stuck. Good. Any other thoughts from the process? Mm -hmm. All right, who haven't we heard from? Michael, your group? Who are Okay. Um, Are they going to taste any better than normal vegetables? Yes. <laughs> well, they're not flavored vegetables. They just have vegetables in them, and they give you different flavor flavors. 
Okay. So you can do like pizza vegetables. Are they going to be require refrigeration? Um, <laughs> I guess it depends on which kind you get. If you get kind of squishy, uh -huh. fruity ones, they'll probably require we refrigeration. We don't have a right now. Uh -huh. okay. Vegetables. So wait, you you guys you guys br <laughs> <laughs> vegetables. Awesome. I'd buy one. Yeah. All right. It's good. I like this. We broke the trend. We had we had recreation, uh, sports, recreation, and then we went to nutrition. So we had a, we broke the trend here. All right, nutrition or, or recreation? Neither. Okay. Epic. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny balls, steel balls that will, you know, like if a company has a product that they are, they want to produce, like they want, they are creating a model of their product. They can model it uh, electronically, like create a graphic model on the computer, and then introduce uh, electromagnetic field that will somehow communicate with this uh, graphic model that they have on the computer. And then bring those tiny balls together to to generate a physical model of that product. So mm -hmm. when you're uh, presenting your the model of your product, you can just be able to generate it physically with these tiny balls. Wow. So it just sort of whoosh, comes and forms together ele electromagnetically and yeah. Oh. Interesting. Something All right. you want to have on your desk at work. <laughs> Uh, what do you think you'd be able to produce it for? <laughs> only this would be only for the elite class of individuals, CEOs, CFOs, people of this nature. And you can have different status, like platinum, gold. And you can walk around saying, hey, "What's your status with your balls?" <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Uh, very expensive. <laughs> so, v very, very focused target market. Very Okay. So let's see. So the vegetables would probably have the biggest target market, maybe, and then maybe the the footballs, number two, and then maybe uh, let's see the no more bindings, number three, uh, and the the recreballs. What, what did you come up with the name? Water balls, water ski balls, maybe number four, and then you guys have the have the smart the smallest target market, huh? Okay. All right. All right. Now, what's what's the funniest idea any of you came up with? What's the funniest thing anyone said in your groups that you remember? Probably U ball. U ball. The universal ball. It's a ball again, judging on someone's status. So this could be more like, yeah. I feel like adults love toys, like an iPhone shows sort of status or that. So yeah, it could be like platinum. That's what I kind of wrote the code for. But uh, platinum, gold, or whatever. But essentially, it's just a ball, and it revolutionizes everything. You can turn on your car, it can open your house, it can have an alarm system into it. Your 16 year old daughter is supposed to be home from prom. She has her own, you know, and you can have little different designs on it, whatever. And your ball will vibrate and let you know. You can go on email or whatever. Let me you know if your 16 year old box is in like 12 o'clock. So kind of like an alarm system built in. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful universal ball. So it's every time. Okay. You can talk about your ball size. What color is your ball? Uh huh. Okay. You got stolen. You can shut it down. I love it. Your, there's an app for it. You can shut it down with your iPhone and make it completely. There's insurance on it. Everyone has it. 
That's just it. You were the marketing is perfectly genius. I got a platinum. <laughs> so it, it's basically like this, but just a ball shape. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you put my ball on the top. Uh, okay. Anything else you you learn from this experience? Okay. If you were going to implement this in your organization to brainstorm for an idea, what would you do differently? Would you? Would you break down into groups of five, or do you think it's better in a group of 25? Smaller. Smaller? Okay. Did, did, now, I thought it was interesting how you took Tony's idea and then you know, combined it with your idea, and you, you had some of the features of both the universal ball and the, uh, the other electromagnetic design balls. Okay. Did that happen a lot, that something one of the persons in your group said sparked something and combined it with what you were thinking and you put it together? Yeah. Okay. Any other thoughts about what you learned in the process? I think it's maybe important not to have like a super hardcore time limit on it because I know in our group, in the brainstorming, there's like a couple of ideas came out and then it was like brainstorming stopped because we felt like we couldn't really thoroughly brainstorm. Okay. Don't have to constraint. All right, let's uh, let's quickly look at some of these. The right answer. Uh, are we sometimes thinking you have to come up with the right answer? You know, we're locked into, you know, you know, what does the teacher want? What's what does he want on this assignment? So I gotta instead of coming up with something creative and something meaningful, I have to lock in and hone in on what the professor really wants or what the boss really wants, okay? Um, here, here's a, a story. Uh, several centuries ago, a curious but deadly plague appeared in a small village in Lithuania. What was curious about this disease was its grip on its victim. As soon as the person contracted it, he'd go into a deep, almost death-like coma. Most died within a day, but occasionally a hardy soul would make it back to full bloom of health. The problem was that since 18th century medical technology wasn't very advanced, the unafflicted had quite a difficult time telling whether the victim was dead or alive. Then one day it was discovered that people had, that someone had been buried alive. This alarmed the townspeople, so they called a town meeting to decide what should be done to prevent such a situation from happening again. After much discussion, most people agreed on the following solution. They decided to put food and water in every casket next to the body. They would even put an air hole from the casket up to the earth's surface. These procedures would be expensive, but they would be more than worthwhile if they would save people's lives. Another group came up with a second, less expensive right idea. They proposed implanting a 12-inch long stake in every coffin lid directly over the victim's heart. That that who, what, then whatever doubts there were about the person being dead or alive would be eliminated as soon as the coffin lid was closed. What differentiated the two solutions were the questions used to find them. The first group asked, what should we do if we bury somebody alive? The second group wondered, how can we make sure everyone we bury is dead? <laughs> mm -hmm. So the answers you get depends on the questions you ask. You know, I didn't try to say, you know, it has to be a small bouncy ball that's red. You know, I, did, I tried to not give you any guidelines other than ball. Uh, play with your wording to get different answers. One technique is to solicit multiple plural answers. Another is to ask questions that whack people's thinking. One woman told me she had a manager who would keep her mind on its toes by asking questions such as, what are three things you feel totally neutral about? Or, what parts of your problem do you associate with tax returns, and what parts of your problems do you associate with poetry? You know, some, just some random questions to, to keep them guessing and to not get locked in on just one right answer. 
These again are some ideas from the book uh, we were talking about on Tuesday, uh, Whack on the Side of the Head by Roger Von Eck. Okay, number two, that's not logical. Oh, come on, that's a bunch of crap. That's not logical, you know, the put down. Yeah, doesn't that happen a lot in, in, in our, our groups there? Um, okay, <laughs> remember the world is not logical. Here's some ideas or, or some principles of that. The glow worm isn't a worm. A firefly isn't a fly. The English horn isn't English, it's French. And it's not a horn, it's a woodwind. The Harlem Globetrotters did not play a game in Harlem until they've been playing for 40 years. You know, we name or refer to things not to be precise, but to get, grasp a general sense of them. All right, how about number three? Does that trip us up a lot? You're not following the rules. You know, you know what if one of your groups had refused to stop talking when I said, time's up? <laughs> like Joni said, we, we were just getting good, you know, it was starting to flow, and then you shut us down, you know? So sometimes you need to break the rules. Pablo Picasso said, every act of creation is first of all an act of destruction. Do you remember, uh, have you ever heard of the Gordian Knot, G-O-R-D-I-A-N? Um, in 33 BC, Macedonian general Alexander uh, solved how to untie the Gordian Knot. Uh, the legend was, he who unties it will become king of Asia. And what did he do, Max? Chopped it. Yeah. Everyone was locked into following the rules of untying it. And he just came along and whoop, with his sword and got it open that way. Um, how about uh, what happened during World War II with tank warfare? What did Rommel do? Uh -huh. The Blitzkrieg, they called it, the lightning strikes of very fast tanks. Remember, World War I was fought in trenches, you know, you were. 20 feet away from your enemy in trenches. It was a very, you know, close, confined battles. And then suddenly World War II comes along and the German army comes up with lightning strikes of panzers, panzer divisions of tanks that would, would you know, vastly change the, the rules of warfare. Um, it, now, don't be culturally offended at this, but someone made the joke, Sacred cows make great steaks. All right. So, if you spend all your time studying, how many of you study the music? Really? Not very many, huh? All right. Listen to something different. If you are so locked into rock music, spend some time listening to classical. Or if you're into jazz, spend a little time listening to country. You know, go beyond your rules of what you think is, is acceptable. Mm -hmm. If you always get up at the same time every day, get up at a different time. Um, right? if, you, if, you're, if you are a, a late night person, instead get up early and read Shakespeare at 5.30 in the morning. <laughs> All right. Uh, be practical. You know, that, that's a, a, a put down we often get. You know, you, you can't be whimsical. Um, what about if we lived our lives backwards? You should die first, get it out of the way. Then you live for 20 years in your old age home and get kicked out when you're too young. You get a gold watch and then you go to work. You work 40 years until you're young enough to enjoy your retirement. You go to college and you party until you're ready for high school. Then you go to grade school, you become a little kid, you play, you have no responsibilities, you become a little baby, you go back into the womb, you spend your last nine months floating and you finish off as a gleam in somebody's eye. All right. 
How about this? Uh, there was a sanitation department in the city in the Netherlands and they had a litter problem. And they were trying to decide how can we get more beautiful litter-free streets. And someone came up with the idea to uh, double the littering fines. Uh, they tried this, but it had little effect. Another approach was to increase the number of litter agents who patrolled the area. This was more the same, uh, just to punish the litterer. And it had little impact on the problem. Then someone asked the following question. What if our trash cans paid people money when they put their trash in? We could put an electric sensing device on each one as well as a coin return mechanism. Whenever a person put trash in the can, it would pay him. This idea is, you know, a little offbeat, right? Is it practical? Mm. What happens if you have people find out about it and they start bringing trash in from other cities to get money and feed your uh, coin-operated uh, uh, trash can? What? Just throw rocks into it. Ooh, there's, yeah, non-trash items there. Ocean sensor, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. How about what they finally thought of doing is to, instead of giving out money, something that costs you money, try to give out something else that would, people would perceive as a reward for putting trash in. What, would, what could that be? Without any expense. You know, there would be an expense to candy. A holiday. A holiday? Yeah. How, would you, eh, how would you do that? Oh, come on, be practical, Shem. That's it. Come on, be practical. A polite thank you message or something? All right, what else? What else would people get some joy out of? A joke. A joke! When someone puts a piece of litter in the can, it tells them a joke. So they get a reward, but it doesn't cost them anything. Okay. All right. Uh, play is frivolous. You know, sometimes it's good to play, get rid of the stress, change your point of view, and you come up with some things that you see uh, that you weren't normally seeing. All right. So what do John the Baptist and Winnie the Pooh have in common? Good, good. Well, what other big thing? They have the same middle name. <laughs> <laughs> what do you get when you combine the godfather with a lawyer? An offer you can't understand. All right. How about, uh, how about this one? Someone posted... <laughs> Uh, this sign at their work and it said John Rowe R-O-E is now the proud papa of a bouncing 8 pound 3 ounce baby boy mama and baby are doing fine and resting comfortably at St. Joe's Hospital name the baby contest for the next two days his colleagues posted their ideas on the bulletin board for John Rowe's baby Okay, here's some of their, their names of what they came up in their playfulness to name the baby. Henry David Thoreau, Zorro, Cicero, a long road to, uh, a long road to row, <laughs> far row, uh, whiskey row, wheelbarrow, uh, Fidel Castro, <laughs> Jethro, uh, Figaro, um, Afro, <laughs> uh, uh, let's see, Skid Row. <laughs> um, oh, there, there, there were just, they came up like 20 different ones. Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden, G, row? <laughs> right. Broken arrow, 
uh, Kilimanjaro. <laughs> All right, so if you want to get creative, have some fun. All right. Ooh, how about number six? Doesn't that stifle creativity in a lot of organizations? That's not my area. You know? Oh, I have these limits on what I'm responsible for, what you can do. You can't, you can't give me an idea. That's not your area. You know, that's my area. You can't, you can't get into my area. Um, Kodachrome film was first developed by a musician. The ballpoint pen was invented by a sculptor. The pneumatic tire was developed by a veterinarian. The long plane record was developed by a television engineer. The automatic telephone was developed by an undertaker. The parking meter was invented by a journalist. Louis Pasteur was not an MD. The Wright brothers were bike mechanics, not aeronautical engineers. Well, to be fair, nobody was an aeronautical engineer at that point. <laughs> OK. All right, how about um, don't be foolish? <laughs> a man walks into the waiting room of a doctor's office. He looks around and is surprised by what he sees. Everybody is in their underwear. People are drinking coffee in their underwear, reading magazines in their underwear, and carrying on conversations in their underwear. He's shocked at first, but then decides that they must know something he doesn't. After about 20 seconds, he also takes off his clothes and sits down in his underwear. You know, don't be foolish. Don't stand out. You know, isn't that, isn't that a, a lock on our creativity? You, you don't want to look different than your peers, so you better conform. Uh, a woman waits patiently for an elevator in an office building. After a short period, the elevator arrives and the doors open. As she looks in, she notices that everybody is turned around and facing to the rear of the elevator. So she too gets in the elevator and faces the rear. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's, uh, what is the, uh, the Jewish law for trials? Think about that. If all vote for death, then what happens? The person is acquitted. They don't want to have 100% unanimity in their trials, or that to them represents that maybe something was wrong and no one was thinking outside the box. So we should maybe not convict the person. Uh -huh. All right, here's one that sort of goes along with your assignment from yesterday. Um, Christopher Williams, a designer, tells a story about an architect who built a cluster of large office buildings that were set in a central green. When construction was completed, the landscape crew asked where he wanted the sidewalks between the buildings. Not yet, was the architect's reply. Just plant the grass solidly between the buildings. That was done, and by late summer, the new lawn was laced with a pathway of trodden grass connecting the buildings to each other and to the outside. As Williams put it, the paths followed the most efficient line between the points of connection, turning in easy curves rather than right angles, and were sized according to the traffic flow. In the fall, the architect simply paved the pathways. Not only did the pathways have a design beauty, but they responded directly to user needs. See? Good, good way of you know, being different. All right, the last two, pretty interesting as well. You know, don't be wrong. You know, how, we're, we're afraid of taking a risk with an idea because someone will come on and say, oh, that's wrong. Or just the basic one, I'm not a creative person. Okay. Anyone have uh, a grass solution they want to share from the homework from today? What was one of the, Anthony? Um, oh, it's a piece of crap. Initially, <laughs> initially it was to have uh, a dog tied on a chain that would extend to the corner of the yard so that, you know, it would actually prevent them from happening or doing that. Okay. And eventually it would condition the children that they would know that there's a dog on a chain there and then eventually you could take the dog away and maybe have a chain wrap into a house so that they would presume that there's a dog still there 
if they walked on the lawn, so it would kind of condition the children. If that didn't work, it would be motion sensors, so a fence would come up when there was somebody walking by to kind of say, stay out of my lawn. Mm -hmm. And if that didn't work, um, then uh, motion sensor sprinklers, so when they walked in to the point of no return, sprinklers would go on and they'd be soaked with urine. <laughs> okay. Or right. we could just do a little small white picket fence. Okay. All right. Um, Shanghai. Oh, uh, it's not. It's kind of stupid, but like I was thinking, maybe build a big wing, wing wheel, like. Okay. Yeah, and then that it's really big, so the like, kids they cannot pass, and then it can also cool your house down and destroy it. Cool. Yeah, no air conditioning. So you're gonna make them walking across their lawn produce energy? Um, yeah, I can. Prevent produce, them from walking. Yeah, just like so, it's big enough so the kids they can walk. Okay, so you gotta get rid of the grass and put a Ferris wheel there. <laughs> <laughs> right, that's okay. That's okay. Windmill. Windmill. All right. Yes. What were your favorite ones? <laughs> no, what? No, we don't. We're not trying to find the right answer. Max. Uh, I think the a few favorites of the ones I came up with. Uh, I really like the moat, build a moat around my lawn and install water jets in it and start a rumor that I keep piranha in there and then occasionally throw bones from dinner in there and turn on the water jets so it looks like something's getting eaten alive. Okay. Um, yeah, that'll, that'll keep kids away pretty well. Nobody wants to be eaten alive. Um, I also like the gnomophobia because just have a whole bunch of lawn gnomes all over the lawn and then have them on remote so from inside I can move them or make them turn. So as the kids walk across the lawn, and then they turn and look behind them. All the lawn gnomes have turned and are staring at them. <laughs> and they will never walk on your lawn again. Mm -hmm. Are there the trained mongoose to chase them? A trained mongoose, a trained mongoose. All right. All right, a couple others. We got time for just a couple more. Yes? Rose bushes. Rose bushes. Okay. And then a maple or three bucks. Oh. Something more attractive than your lawn. Okay, that that was an interesting approach. A lot of you used that one to you know have a distraction that was more attractive than your lawn. All right, one more, one more you want to share? Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, a zip line across the lawn. All right. I hope this week you have appreciated. The creativity process. Hang on, hey, don't 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 close up too yet. Uh, we got 20 seconds here. Uh, I read a book how there are 3,000 different varieties of mushrooms in the United States and Canada, um, and there are 350,000 plants in the world, and there are 50,000 different types of spiders. So. I hope you appreciate how creative Heavenly Father is. I mean, he is the ultimate creative genius, and all of us have a little spark of that in us. So I hope you are more creative, you come up with some great ideas to change the world and to make yourselves rich and then use those riches to do good in the world. See you Tuesday.